Welcome. I'm Jessica Tejan, and this is the Evolving to Exceptional podcast, where we talk about reaching peak performance in our workplaces, homes, and communities so that we can live our best life possible, an exceptional life. I want to welcome back our listeners to this week's episode of the Evolving to Exceptional podcast. We have with us today, Jill O'Connell. She is the Human Resources Director in a law firm local here in St. Louis, and I'm really excited to get in and talk about some of the current experiences she's having. It's always fun to hear about the human resources side in a law firm, given that I you know, originally went to law school and I've got that background, but I haven't been in a law firm in, in many years. And being able to hear and, and see what's going on there from a people and performance and human resource perspective. And Jill's going to talk to us about some of that and some of the areas of human performance that she's really passionate about and what she's seeing happen right now as well. So Jill, welcome to the show. And I'm so excited to have you here. I would love for you to maybe just share with our listeners a little bit more about who you are, how you got to where you are today, and why it is that you do what you do. All right. Thank you very much for having me. I started out, I I took a long road to get where I am today. I started out as a, what we would refer to today as a legal administrative assistant. Back in the day, we called it legal secretary. And from there, I did that for many years. And then I moved into a paralegal role and it was at a firm where I was in the paralegal space that I was presented with the opportunity to move into a law firm administration role. And and that particular firm, it was a relatively small firm, but it was growing really quickly. And so my role encompassed all aspects of law firm management, except for finance. Anybody who knows me would say, stay away from the accounting side. (laughs) That said, so I stayed in that for a few years in that law firm administrator role. My children at that time were very young and I was going through some issues in my marriage. And so I felt like with the number of hours that I was working there, which was 75, 80 hours a week over week, I just couldn't give my family the kind of attention that I needed to give it at that time. So I left legal altogether, went to a manufacturing space, spent uh, nine years working as an executive administrator for a manufacturing company and got really great experience there dealing with all kinds of folks. And this was a union organization. So I got that background, which was really fun to get. And I really enjoyed it there. And then ultimately that led me here. And I came here in 2015 and it was a It was one of those things where a friend of mine said, oh, I really want you to apply for this HR director position. And I thought, "Eh, I don't know if I really want to go back to legal, (laughs) but I was encouraged to go ahead and apply because the, uh, one of the, one of the shareholders here, one of the founders is someone that I had known for many years. And so I thought, okay, I'll go ahead and give it a shot. And I loved it and pretty much been here ever since. So having had both the the legal background experience and the manufacturing experience, is there anything in particular that stands out as being really different between the two of what you have to manage or deal with that's just really different between those two environments? Absolutely. The manufacturing environment, and really I would say probably the corporate environment as a general rule, the chain of command is much more clear if once a decision is made and it starts to trickle down to everybody that needs to do their part, it's very clear what their part is and what the expectations are. So I did learn a lot in, about how to make that a little more clear, even in the legal space, but it's still just a, it's just a different dynamic. And then the other thing I would say that really stood out to me with the manufacturing space is that there really isn't a lot of politicking, or at least at the place I was, there really wasn't a lot of image type stuff that lawyers tend to think about people in the manufacturing space. They just 
don't care about that. They're just normal people doing their job and they just want to do their job and go home. And, and the hours were much more manageable and even for management. I remember one of the managers there told me one time, he said, if I'm doing my job well, I hardly need to be in the office at all. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's a really good way to look at it. Whereas I think in the law firm space, because you have so many, every firm is designed a little bit differently depending on what type of organization they are. Many of them are partnerships. Some of them are LLCs. Our particular one is a, a, is a professional corporation. And so we have shareholders. Some places call them partners. Some places call them members. But for us, it's shareholders. And every shareholder has a much bigger stake in the organization than, say, a manager would in a corporate environment. They're all owners. And so you're working directly with the owners of the company. And it isn't one owner. It's multiple owners. So even though we do have a president, vice president, we have all of the normal positions. And with that comes different levels of authority in different areas. At the same time, you really do have to be sensitive to the other owners and not just the board of directors, but really firm-wide all of those stakeholders. Do most of the shareholders work for the company or are there any that don't actively work in the company? That's a really good point. In our firm, they currently all work for the company. And really they would always, because once someone decided to leave the way that our bylaws are written, we would be buying out their shares so they would no longer be a shareholder. That's just how we happen to do it. I'm, But we do have folks that I'm sure at some point will retire. It's just, they would probably not be shareholders any longer with us. And in the manufacturing space, the opposite was true. Our shareholders didn't work for the firm at or the company at all. And they really just popped in every once in a while to get reports from us about how things were going. So it was very different. So it's interesting. You would think that having the shareholders, the, the owners of the organization within the company would create, a first of all, a greater sense of ownership, right, in the company and in what they're trying to accomplish, as well as, as, well as maybe some conflict in terms of different owners having different thoughts about things and who really makes the decision. And of course, it's a law firm and, and lawyers are great at creating very detailed laws and processes and here's how it's going to work and here's making sure that there isn't a question of ambiguity there, but I could still see conflict coming up around that. Is that your experience? What is that to work in that type of environment or with, with that type of structure? I definitely think that there is far more opportunity for conflict. I will say this firm that I happen to work with right now does a really good job of only, so the little background with the firm's history is that when they started the firm, they really looked at what they didn't want as opposed to what they did want, or at least that's the way the story is told to all of us that have come along since. And one of the things they did not want is to deal with people who were just not nice to other people. They wanted all of their shareholders to be people that they enjoyed working with and that were just, they have all different kinds of personalities, but nice to one another and treating everyone with dignity and respect is just a huge cornerstone of who we are. For that reason, there is a lot of deference paid to the people who are charged with making some of these decisions our president, who is who I report to directly, and I also report to the board. The so president and the board of directors are given a lot of deference by the, by the shareholders. And at the same time, sometimes there are decisions that are just tough for everyone, and you have to make those hard decisions. And so it is, there is a lot more when I use the word politicking, I'm not necessarily using that in a negative sense, and I'm certainly not using it in like a the, the sense of like running for office. But what I mean by that is that there's just, you have to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with the people who are really going to be affected by something. And 
really try to hear their concerns. In a corporation, I think it, at least my experience there, it was really different. It was once that decision was made by, let's say, the uh, president and the board, then that was just reported to everyone. This is the decision. Here is what we're going to do. And even the shareholders, really, most things were told to them after they were done. Mm -hmm. There were some things that they that we waited to get their approval for, but most of the time we just ran the business. Whereas with in a law firm, we have things still to this day. For example, when we bring a shareholder on, one of our rules is we don't do direct lateral hires. We bring somebody in as what would in some some firms would be known as a non-equity partner. In our firm, we call them a principal as opposed to principal attorney as opposed to a shareholder. So they come in with no equity stake. And then after a year to two years, a decision is made about whether or not they're really a good fit for the firm. And usually that comes down to, are they treating people with dignity and respect and all of that. And then it's only after that, that they become a shareholder. So for us, I think we just really are very fortunate that we have good people, but no matter who they are, no matter what person it is, we all have feelings and we all bring our whole self right to every single thing we do. So I feel like it's very important for me to establish good relationships with all of our shareholders to really understand their concerns and to try to bring that back to the conversations that go on with the board and, and so on and so forth. And I honestly, I feel the same way about the staff or support personnel. I feel like they are, it is also important for me to listen to them and understand how certain things are going to impact them and take that into consideration as we move through decisions that are made. So in a lot of ways, when I think about the traditional corporate structure and certainly my experience with it, there's a little, a lot more hierarchy involved of this decision's been made. You have to defer to your supervisor or to, to the, the executive who's made that decision and live with it. It's just the way that it is. And in this environment, it actually sounds really great to me where there's a little more opportunity to, and I like how you tried, it's like politicking, but it's not. It's really about caring about the people and the impact and what's going to happen and, and looking at things holistically rather than just making a decision and let the fallout be what it will be. It's maybe taking into account those factors and the personalities and the people and the roles a little bit more than you might see in a corporate setting. That's right. And, and that is a good, that is a really positive thing where it becomes difficult is, and I have worked at other firms where this has been the case where you have really strong personalities with competing interests. And when that happens, especially when you have people that are not very, um, I hate to use the term straightforward, that's not exactly what I mean, but they maybe have a hidden agenda, right? So they're not exactly forthright or forthcoming about what it is that they truly want. And when you have an environment like that, it's really tough to ever move the ball forward because you've always got somebody kind of blocking. So with this firm, though, it is a great thing. And because you have an environment where everyone is not, and I say everyone because it really truly is everyone. Is it every day? Maybe not. But for the most part, you have everyone bringing as much empathy and as much professionalism as they can possibly bring to the conversation so that when you do, even if somebody is really upset, about something that might be being talked or discussed, they are able to still listen through that. And that's hard. And so I really respect that when I am in those conversations that are difficult, especially with our shareholders. And this time of year, they always happen, right? Because it's budgeting time and it's insurance renewal time. And so there's a lot of decisions that get made at this time of the year for, at least for my firm. So 
there are things that people are passionate about. And so knowing that I can go into those meetings and I can be heard, they can be heard, and everybody has an opportunity to weigh in. It is really, in the end, a lot better, I think. Just as human beings, we want to be able to be heard. It is, in some ways, more challenging to manage that way. Um, Takes more time, for sure. But I really, that's what feeds me a little bit. I really love that connection to the people and knowing what it is that makes them tick and why they want certain things. And then it also helps me grow and learn because sometimes I'm blind to something. I think we all are in some ways. And so that's one of the reasons that having different people coming at something from different perspectives is really helpful. So I'm curious, given your kind of history in in the legal space and um, with the HR, HR space in particular, what have you seen change throughout the years in the law in the legal space as the law firms have approached people in performance? What practices are in place? What has been areas of focus or areas of challenge that have maybe evolved over recent years in this space? My gosh, I've been around a long time, (laughs) so I have seen a lot of changes. Um, The two sea change times that I particularly in in particular that I saw was the first one would have been around 2004 ish. And then the other one has been post COVID or maybe probably even before that we saw some of these changes, but COVID certainly accelerated them. So here is what, when I first started out, every law firm that I was ever aware of and that I ever heard about operated on a a pretty similar, in a pretty similar way. So what would happen is that you had associate attorneys that would start at a firm when they got out of law school. Um, They would be given all of the work that just was either entry level type attorney work, basic stuff, but also just, it could be in any area of law across the board. They just took everything. And then the, then there were your mid-level partners that mostly, they still took work of their own, and then they would push other work down to the associates. And then you had your senior attorneys and of counsel attorneys that had those associates are in a pledge situation. So they are really expected to be working all the time. They were had to have FaceTime, had to show up in the office on Saturdays, whether they had work to do or not. It was very important um, to their future career. And then, so all these mid-level folks had already gone through that. And then they were looking forward to the time when they could, just like the more senior associates or senior attorneys had in their firms, move to enough counsel. And by of counsel, what we mean when we talk about that is somebody that truly didn't have a lot of cases to manage or anything like that. They were just there. They would come in when they felt like it for as long as they felt like it, but they were a resource of wisdom and knowledge that the younger attorneys or less experienced attorneys could really draw on. And they were very valuable in that role. Um, And attorneys also, until they got to that phase in their life, they all worked a ton of hours. The expectation was that they were going to work pretty much every day of the week. Many of them, and I will even say us, because a lot of us that that were working in law firms, no matter what our role was, we were very committed. It was like who we were was our firm, and that was our life. I'm not going to say there was no one that worked at a law firm that didn't think they were just working to live. But most of the folks at that time were living to work. And we, even to the point where when we had like a, something big going on, a big closing or a big trial or something like that, where everybody was working a lot of extra time, you would think, oh my gosh, we worked so late. And so why wouldn't everybody just go home then? be really eager to get home. But the reality of what we did in that time was 
it would be maybe it was 10 o'clock at night and we'd say, okay, we got to come down off this day. Let's go have a drink. <laughs> so we'd be even later getting home. We might be out for a couple more, three hours after that. So that's how it was when I first started. Then in, like I say, around 2004 or so, there was a big change in terms of what compensation was being given to associate attorneys in particular. And at the same time that was happening, there was also a uh, desire on the part of a lot of associate attorneys that they were not going to, they just wouldn't work the extra time. They worked hard and they, I'm not going to say they didn't work eight hour days. They worked longer than that, but they weren't coming in for no reason, just for the FaceTime. That was just, they just weren't going to do it. So what happened is that those, at that time, those people that were in the middle that were looking forward to being able to become this sort of senior of counsel attorney weren't able to do that because they, in order to keep their practice going, they had to continue to work on into their later years. And so that was a huge sea change that I saw. Then over the last, I don't know, 20 years probably, but 10 years especially, I would say there's been a whole lot of conversation in kind of every environment, I would think, about well-being and about having some kind of, we used to call work-life balance. Now I've heard it called work-life integration and different kinds of things. But we there's been a lot of conversation around that. Some firms have been really proactive about um, making that happen. But for the most part, we were all looking at it through a certain paradigm that here's how much people generally have worked at our firms, and this is how they've done the work. So now we're going to try to figure out ways that they can maybe work a little bit less. That was always the conversation. How can they work a little bit less, have a little bit more time with their families? And then COVID comes along and suddenly everybody is forced to work remote. Most firms would never have said they would ever want any of their employees working remote other than their attorneys. Um, but now that they saw that it worked, many of the firms have said, okay, yeah, we want to go ahead and still offer that. Some of them really embraced it and even designed things so that they were able to cut back on the amount of physical space that they lease, which was able to cut, they were able to cut expenses in that way. So in those firms, they don't want people coming in more than a couple of times a week. And there's a lot more office sharing type things going on. Our firm does a lot of hybrid. We don't, we didn't, we haven't gone so far as to say we, we really encourage people to be fully remote. We do have a couple of folks that are fully remote, but for the most part, we do this hybrid. Um, the other thing that happened at, in, during COVID or just post COVID was the compensation, everybody's expectations, whether that's a staff person, an associate attorney, this, the expectation of, increased compensation went through the roof. And that's tough because at a, at a law firm, we make our money based on hours that people work, at least our firm does. There are a lot of firms who are considering, or at least a lot of buzz in the community about changing the hourly billing model to something that is more uh, pay for a service type things. As a practical matter for most firms, that really hasn't happened yet, at least not in this area of the country. So there's a sort of pinch happening where you have newer folks coming in saying, we want a much higher salary. And by the way, we don't want to work so many hours. And as leaders, I think, especially in the HR space, I feel like it's really important for us to recognize that people do uh, really need to have that. We've learned scientifically that people really need to have some downtime, they cannot have their foot on the gas all the time, every day after day. And they get burnt out. They, in the legal community, every, I'm sure, it's a really across the board, but 
um, attorneys for many years have been some of the highest percentage of folks in that industry that are um, at risk for suicide, at risk for drug addiction and alcohol addiction. So that is a real, that's real. That's not just some flower child kind of stuff going on. That's a real concern. And I think that things like email and texting and just all of that expectation from clients that you're going to be available 24 seven puts an awful lot of pressure on attorneys. And even though they're not maybe in the office, the way that those attorneys were back in a hundred years ago, when I first started out, they actually have more pressure on them on the, in the, during the time when they're not in the office, because back then, unless somebody had your home telephone number, which people were very hesitant to ever use, you, it was pretty much when they weren't in the office, they weren't working. So I think we do have to be careful about recognizing. I'm, I also really think that we need to put our money where our mouth is. We can't say one thing and do something different. So if we are going to say that we are we believe that well-being is very important to us, which our firm does say that, then we need to be thinking of that in every aspect of our expectations and how we treat folks. And at the same time, we have to keep our eye on the bottom line. So that's really where we are right now is trying to figure out how can we kind of work from both ends of that to get to a place where we're a happy medium. And it's challenging, I think. Of different firms, I've talked to some firms that have found really great efficiencies so that they can get their ratios down of support personnel to attorney. So instead of having one LAA support three attorneys, you now have one LAA supporting maybe 10 because of some technology and some uh, efficiencies that they've worked out. Um, so I've seen that model and I've also seen the model of the, the as I mentioned earlier, the reduction of their physical space. So they don't have to pay for quite as much of that, that frees up some money for them to do other things. But every firm is looking for something, some kind of solution to this. So I, I love that you pointed out the complexity of the working world because certainly for lawyers, but I think it applies to a lot of different arenas, the access, the uh, frequency or the, the feeling of still being responsible for responding to work requests or things that are coming in has certainly scoped there's been a lot of scope creep into our homes, our personal lives, our other things that are going on. And I think the lines of demarcation used to be much better when it came to what was part of work and what was part of home. And as that's all blended together, it's created kind of a host of challenges. Can you speak to what you're seeing right now in, in your workplace or workplaces in general that is truly a, a challenge? You talked about its end of year year and you're looking at the budgeting and what are you going to do next? What is a really critical area of focus for you from a human resources, people and performance perspective that you're trying to focus on or address or that you're really looking at and paying attention to as something you need to address given the challenge or given what's on the horizon? That's a really good question. I think I feel like I have a lot of things that I'm trying, that I feel are really important for me to really look at. And so one of those is how do you make people feel connected and is feeling connected as important as it used to be in terms of your workplace? I'm, I feel very much that I, we have some folks here and I, and in all of the different organizations that I have networked in, we all talk about, or there are a lot of people who are saying, we need to get people in the office more often because we need to reconnect. 
or we need to not let people work remote because it really has diminished the relationships among coworkers. And I look at it from a little bit different perspective because to me, I don't think that's changing. I don't think we can put the genie back in the bottle. I think we have to figure out, number one, how can we make people feel heard, connected, respected, whether they're on site or remote. And number two, we have to think about what does that look like to someone who's maybe in their 30s or their 20s? They're going to be looking at that in a very different way than someone like myself in their 50s thinking, okay, how is like some of them who are really high performers do a great job. They don't want anything to do with the people they work with. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that's kind of true. They are professional. They will work with those people. But when they're at the end of the day, they'd rather be spending as much time as they can with their family or friends outside of work. And they don't really have a strong desire. So for them, creating all these great get to know you team building kinds of things for them that's not attractive. So what's the balance? Because I do believe that we need to have in order to be as efficient as we could be and in order to communicate in a way that is helpful and can move our industry forward. I do think there needs to be some connection. There can't be no connection. And, but I don't necessarily, I just, that to me is a, a big challenge. What does that look like? And then another big thing to me with the, when talking about the budgeting and all of that is <clears throat> what are my employees saying they need? Because I want to, I want people to understand that I've heard them. When planning for our, as an example, our benefits, we had some folks who had specific concerns about the benefits that we offered and had put, had asked for some different things. And that was in the front of my mind when I was speaking with our broker about what kinds of plans we were going to offer. I wanted to make sure that I was presenting something that fit with what I was hearing they needed or they wanted. So I wanted to be sure that I heard that. Same thing with the initiatives that we're laying out for 2024. Some of them are just things that we've needed to do or just need to do as a business, right? And they really, it wasn't like some specific person made a request about it. But there are several things that really don't cost a whole lot of money that would be really meaningful to our employees. And so knowing what those are and trying to implement them, I think is really important and certainly important to me. Um, but at the same time, that is also a challenge because um, really, I think more so now than probably ever in my career, the bang for your buck is really important. You have to make sure that you are getting real true ROI and that doesn't necessarily mean dollar for dollar. It's not some of the things that we're talking about today and that are really important in the workplace are hard to quantify with numbers. It's more um, the values there and the improvements are there, but they aren't tangible. So it's a little bit more difficult for some folks, but having to me, having that balance of it's worth investing in, for example, professional development, for people. Even if a great example, we have we have a professional development budget for all of our support personnel, non attorneys. We have them for attorneys too, but for our for for our support personnel, we have something in the budget for that. We don't have a whole lot of support personnel who have taken us up on that. There's a pretty small number of people that have wanted to do that. So the one of the things that gets raised is should we have that in there because nobody's really using it and where i'm my perspective on that is 
yeah, but it's available. And that means something to people. Just knowing that we're supportive of that and we want them to continue on their growth journey in whatever direction that might take them, that's that sends a message that we care about this. And to me, that's just as important as if they actually spend the money. Yeah. So, so let's talk about each of kind of each of those two different topics you just highlighted. I want to go back to the first one around connection and the different perspectives people have on the type of connection that we have in the workplace on, on how much of that and what that means in terms of the activities and the team building and all of those things. And so one of the things that I like to think of when I think of connection is to go back to that we have a heart brain, we have neurons in our heart and within our heart, the, our heart brain is responsible for our connection, our, our relationships, our values and what we find to be important. And there is an in, innate human need for relationship and connection. So really the question is not, do people need connection? Yes, they do. The right. question is, do they need it in their workplace? And what we know from Gallup's years and years of research on this topic is that workplaces with people who have close relationships and friendships substantially outperform, especially in the area of customer service. And so interestingly enough, they, one of Gallup's Q12 questions is about having a best friend at work. Doesn't mean your best friend is your, at, in your workplace, but that you have a work best friend. You have somebody that you go to, that you count on in that workplace, that you trust, that you have that relationship with. And what they found is that people that have relationships that develop that level of trust and relationship work better together and customers want to be around them. They want to work with them. They're fun to work with. They work well. There's not conflict. There's not issues. There's not that negative energy when they're working on whatever they're working on for the customer. And despite multiple organizations trying to get Gallup to change that question or remove that question, they have refused to do so for almost three decades now because that question is so indicative of high performance of organizations and teams that outperform others. And so I always think it's interesting because typically people will say they don't want something when they don't want it because of the environment or experience that they're having. And so they'll say, I don't want connection here because whatever's going on there doesn't feel good or feel natural or there isn't trust or the, the right practices aren't there. And so they would rather go have that connection with their family. And so what I think becomes a challenge for workplaces is how do you build connection in a way that is additive to your workplace culture and performance and not feeling like it's something a person is doing that is taking away from their personal or family time from where they want to be. So is, how can you create that environment or those opportunities for building connection that maybe aren't traditional or aren't the way we would typically think of building connection, but become, become possible? The other thing that stuck out to me in, in, around that topic was that often I find people don't know what they need always. We think we know. We think that I'd rather be with my family than spend more time with the people at work. And yet, if I spend that time with the people at work on the right things, it might make my work experience a whole lot better. And if we don't understand why it's important and it doesn't have an underlying intent, it's just, oh, we're just, I just got to go to happy hour and drink drinks. I don't want to drink and I'd rather go home and put my kids to bed. Yeah, of course, that doesn't sound good. Okay, but do I need to develop deeper relationships with these people? How do I get to know them better? How do we structure those events around that? Because that is going to streamline my work. That's going to make things more effective. And here's how we're going to get there. And I think sometimes people don't see the how or the why that's going to get them to an end result. And so instead, it just looks additive. I don't know. Does that make sense to you? What do you think? Oh, absolutely makes sense. And that's, I didn't say it as well as you did, but that is what I mean when I say, th it's like thinking outside the box. 
I 100% agree that it is, people do need connection. And it is part of well being as well to have that connection. And I also agree that a lot of times it is a trust issue. If people don't feel connected already or don't feel that they can trust the folks that they work with, it does make it more challenging to, to bring them along. But I also think, to your point, it doesn't really, the old ways of doing things to get there need to change, I think. These and I think, actually, I should say, I think there's room for all of it, right? It's not necessarily bad. In fact, we have one attorney here that will, every once in a while, take their work group out for happy hour or for whatever, some kind of little outing. I think that's great. And sometimes that's just, well, that's great to have. And then for other people, like the ones you mentioned that aren't really interested in that, it might just be more about making sure that there's opportunities for connection throughout their work day, throughout their, and that is harder to do when you have people that are remote. I don't have the answers, certainly, but it is something I'm working on trying to We know there, it's tough. Simply going to a happy hour doesn't create connection, right? Mm -hmm. I can go and I cannot really connect with or build relationships with anyone. And I think that's where you get into the the nuance is, especially for the leaders, is are they showing up in a way that people feel like they really want them there and that they really want to know them and they want to understand them? And that takes vulnerability. That's hard. And that takes a level of self-awareness on behalf of everyone willing to engage at that level. But we've all been on a team that's that is that way at some point in our lives, maybe mm -hmm. not in our career, but in our personal life where we were a member of a group or a team where we wanted to go spend time with those people, where we wanted to talk about things and have those relationships. And I think the challenge for the workplace is to figure out how to do that successfully. And it leads into the other challenge you talked about, because I think it's a similar, it's a similar issue, which is when it comes to performance development, and I love what you said. People don't take advantage of it. The money's there, but it says something that it's still there. For years, I had open training, access to just tons of training for employees. I put, I built an L, we built an LMS. We built it out with all these online courses. We put it all together. I thought everybody's going to want their development. They're going to get training. They're going to have access. They can do it at any time they want. And you know what? Almost nobody goes and does it. And so my years of doing this, I've learned everybody loves it once they've done it, but it is so hard to get them to go do it. If it's not an expectation of the job, the company, the culture, if you're not doing it as a team or, or purposely because we're going to create something different, we're going to use it, we're going to apply it, we're going to put it into practice in a particular way, People don't want to do it because it's just training. It's just an extra activity and figuring out how to apply it and make it impactful is really difficult when it's standalone, when it's just an individual person. Mm -hmm. So it's like the other challenge of people don't necessarily know why they should do something or what to do with it. And so then they just don't take advantage of it or they don't engage in it, even though we know from research and from the science of human performance, how critical it is, how critical it is to our brain health, our neurophysiological health, to our organizational health and how organizations perform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and I don't disagree with any of that either. I think so. Certainly with the LMS system, my experience is similar. I have to make that something that is a required thing and it has to be in my case i try to target it a little bit more specifically to each person because i do feel like different people need a little more help in different areas or whatever but but i do know that when things get uh neglected that people are not gonna they're not gonna do it unless they're told to do it and in the way that we happen to implement the professional development budget piece was really 
we didn't approach it in the way that you mentioned. We more approached it as we want you to know that if this is something that you're interested in, we want to support it. So I'm not saying we shouldn't look at it like this is something that we have expectation around. We haven't gotten there yet. Right now, it's more we don't want to turn it into a task at this stage. That might be something that comes down the pike, but at the moment, it's really more about we talk it up. I talk about it at every evaluation. I talk about it at staff meetings where I'm like, hey, you have this available to you. They're a lot of fun. You can have a lot of do a lot of really cool networking and, and that kind of thing. And we'll talk about some of the some of the people who are involved. We'll talk about their experiences sometimes, and that's great. But you're 100% correct that if there are some folks that have never been a part of it, don't know anything about it, won't, don't have any interest in it because they don't understand it or don't, they just don't know what they could get from it. it it's interesting. You used a term there that I think is important to hit on because you use the term professional development. And one of the things I like to do is segment what we mean when we talk about development, because oftentimes, uh, especially if we're thinking back historically, when we think of professional development, we're thinking really of career development. What do I need to do to further my career? Do I need a certification? Do I need a specific skill so that I can move to the next level so that I can progress in terms of my future for future career? For most attorneys, I would imagine given given the law school and the continuing legal education credits, a lot of it's probably wrapped up in in that arena of development or, or taking those types of, of programs. And I, I want to separate that a bit from performance development. And I think sometimes people think about when they hear development, they think about it only in terms of career or next, or maybe they think about it in terms of a skill, like I'm going to get build an Excel skill, or I'm going to work on this, I'm going to build up my ability to do a presentation or something of, of that sort. And not so much in terms of their own holistic development, in terms of the growth of their understanding of how they communicate, how they interact, who they are as a person how they can how they can maximize their well-being you you talked a bit about that how they can tap into or or perform better with clear expectations or giving each other more effective feedback or having accountability and when we think about those areas of development that natural human adult development evolutionary type growth and the creation of new neural pathways i think sometimes people don't see it that way. They don't see that, oh, I could actually do my job better and enjoy it more if I developed this a little bit more, or if I learned how to uh, work with my body a little bit more and balance my nervous system, or if I learned how to give conscious feedback in a way that people are really able to receive it and I can process feedback more effectively, are some of those elements, instead of looking at them as a training course, or a, a, just a training certification or a thing, like you said, a check the box or something that they have to do to be looking at it as something we're doing to continue to grow and evolve our performance and our workplace and how we do things. It's just a little bit, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit of a shift. And in my experience, I've had people really reject career development and maybe lean a little bit more into performance development. Oh yeah, that could, I can, uh, that I could, I could get into that. I don't want to climb a career ladder, but oh yeah, I didn't realize this is what that included, or this is what it meant. And this is why it's important to do some of these things. And that's why I think that having, so we have a well-being and training program here that I think is really, and again, not that we couldn't do a better job, but it is really, it touches on a lot of those things. And so a lot of that to me is um, kind of to your point about different neural pathways. So we, one of the things that I've done a few different training sessions on is sort of truncated version of cognitive behavioral therapy, the unhelpful negative thoughts and trying to retrain how we perceive it, how we feel about information that comes in and how we process information that's 
coming from inside of us. And we've also done a lot around all types of, we've done meditation and we've done walks and we've done just lots of little things. It isn't, like I said, it's not, we're not that big and we don't have that many resources, but what we do have is we have some really great creative people here that are really good at talking about what they do to help them to enjoy things more, to be more effective, all those kinds of things. And so we do lean into that. We have speakers come in and I feel like everybody is, has a different way of learning. So that's another thing that I think is really important. If you have, some people are going to respond really well to having somebody come in and talk about something. Other people, after the first three words, they're not going to hear anything. And having some online things, having some actual material they can put in their hand, having some activities, all those things, I think, hit on different ways that people absorb information. So um, again, we have a long way to go before I feel like we are just killing it, but we do, those are all things that are super important to me. And I do think that we, we need to always be keeping that in mind that there's no two people that are going to learn exactly the same. So I do feel like it's just important to have yes, structure, yes, requirements, but also flexibility so that people can learn the way that they need to learn and they need to learn what will most likely benefit them. Not that they don't want to learn about all of it, but in terms of when they're learning what, I want them to learn the most important things for them at the front end. And it's important too, I think, to listen to where they are, where they're coming from, because you talked a little bit about people don't always know what they need or what they want. Another thing that I see a lot or not a lot, I see sometimes is that people aren't engaged because people have whole different dreams and goals and things that have nothing to do with the job they're in. And sometimes the best thing I can do for somebody is help them find that thing. And it might be, that means they leave us. We had one person left us to go become an EMT. We had another person that started a nonprofit and those things are fantastic. And I, and they are so much happier doing, following their passion. So just as important, I think, as having these requirements, offering the training, having the well-being th things in place, I think there is also this element of, again, really just listening to where people are and opening your mind to say, what is really going to be beneficial for the person and for the firm? Because most of the time, there's something that is going to be if it's good for the employee, it's probably also good for the firm. So having that, that's not always true, right? But, but in many ways it is true because if you really are listening to them and they are saying to you, um, I don't care about this thing. And you start digging beneath that. Why don't you care about it? What is it about this that you don't like? Sometimes it's exactly what you said, where it's, they just don't know enough about it and it just doesn't sound interesting to them. Other people, it might be that they have a real objection to it for some reason that's deep seated and maybe they need a little bit more attention. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I always like to think of even the term well-being is really being well, right? How do we make our being how we're being? And for me, the way that I think about it and I think about it that my being well should coincide with my performing well. So if I can optimize my being, my performance, how I'm doing my performing, how I'm doing my being in the workplace, I'm going to be better. I'm going to have greater well-being. If I'm not paying attention to those things, if I'm if I don't know how to optimize my performance to perform at my best in that context, then I'm not going to be well. And the same ways that we perform at our best in the workplace 
are actually the same things that we need to be doing in the rest of our life to also have well-being, to also be being well. And so I, I really do believe that they do coincide in most cases if you're focused on doing the things that really impact the performance and being that the actual how a person is being and not necessarily their happiness or their that it doesn't it's not going to necessarily going to be their excitement or it's not always going to be something that they think that they want like we talked about earlier with connection sometimes the things that we need to create engagement in people are to help people optimize their performance aren't what we would normally think of aren't the steps we would maybe necessarily take but when, once we do we see those bigger, longer lasting changes, we create those neural pathways that really last for people and make a difference, whether they're in that workplace or any other. And I think that's a huge gift workplaces can give to their employees as well that is that can have a lasting impact on people while it's also creating better performance results because every company that's worked for that that, uses Gallup survey, that's won Gallup's award and has hit those metrics knows that when they have that higher level of engagement, the profitability numbers trend right along with the engagement numbers, almost Mm -hmm. like verbatim. It is so right on target. And so you know that if you can accomplish that, you're going to see the better financial and business results as well. Yep. So Jill, I would love to keep talking to you all day. I think this is just great, but I want to give you a chance to give any final thoughts or words of wisdom or advice that you have for our listeners as we start to bring this episode to a, to a close. I think words of wisdom, I think the main thing is keep learning, keep growing no matter where you are in your career, no matter what role you play, you can be a leader anywhere and you can get so much more out of your life and your relationships when you open your mind up to continuing to learn. The other thing I would say is that included in that learning for me, and I think for, I believe for most people, that also includes learning from others who don't think like you. So having, being in an environment where you're in your bubble, um, it's real easy to feel good. So as you touched on earlier, sometimes what feels good isn't always what's best. And sometimes having those vulnerable conversations, seeing through the anger, the frustration, we live in a very challenging time right now with a lot of anxiety about things that are happening in the world, things that are happening in our country, things that are, there's a lot of change that's happened over the last however many years. And so a lot of people come very hard in their own truth and they don't really make a lot of space for other people's truths. And I think all of us, it's not, it it doesn't really matter to me what, where you are on in your life experience because your life experience is what brought you to where you are today. And I have something to learn from every person. So I would just encourage that. I think that's a wonderful advice and, and so important for everyone everywhere to be thinking about not just their own personal and professional development and their ongoing growth, but also gaining that perspective, gaining those insights from other individuals. The only way that we can really develop when we think about vertical growth and development, the one of the key elements is to gain greater perspective, is to gain a, a better understanding of the world. And we can only only see the world through our own perspective. So the only way we can really gain that perspective is to gain new experiences and exposure to other people's perspectives, is to learn from the life experiences and what other people have encountered. And that is what adds so much value to our own awareness of ourselves and the issues and problems and challenges that we're trying to solve in our workplaces, in our homes, and in our families and throughout our lives. 
As we wrap up this episode of the Evolving to Exceptional podcast, I just want to remind our listeners to always keep evolving, keep growing, keep rewiring those neural pathways so that you can have more exceptional experiences on your life journey so that one day when you look back on your life, you can say you lived an exceptional life. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we will be back again next week with another episode.